Please give a warm welcome to writer, director, Andrew Hay. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Andrew, we talked about um, outside about Francis Bacon, and um, your main character is suspended in in this memory world. Um, can you tell us about that take into the to the character that he's yeah, he's like caught up in memories. I will just say that Roger showed me a picture outside, which was a Francis Bacon picture. And he said, have you seen this? And I'm like, that was the picture that I sent the crew, <laughs> that exact Francis Bacon. So it's kind of amazing. Um, but I, I, there's something about Francis Bacon to his work. And there is this sense that these characters are isolated within this space time and space and they feel like they're floating within it constantly moving within it uh, sort of you feel like there's other forces at work dragging them backwards and forwards somehow is how I feel about his his paintings um, and I knew that I wanted this to have a tone that was both grounded and I guess you could say metaphysical and elevated and odd and strange without being surreal so it was about how I could try and get that tone across um, and I think what you're right it's about him being suspended in this world and whether you see it all as it unfolds or whether you're seeing it as a representation of his subconscious or whatever it might be um, they were kind of all the thoughts that were going on as I was making and the physical where he lives um, is this tower and um, when I watched the film where he lives is uh, like I felt that that's his mind, that is a representation of his world. Yeah, absolutely. Like, when we were trying to find the location, I knew that I wanted it to, f when we were, like, I was discussing with all the, with the heads of department, it's like every decision, I want to feel like it is a manifestation of his aloneness, let's say. So everything we do, whether it's lighting, whether it's production design, whether it's where we put the camera, I want to somehow try and get across the feeling of being alone, and then as the film develops, a feeling of growing intimacy and connection and compassion and all of those things. So it was trying to work on a very kind of uh, level that felt like it was inside. So that apartment, to me, there could be 100 people there living in that apartment, but for him, there's nobody there other than one other person living in that space. So it was more like it was how the world feels to him rather than the world actually is. And I read that you actually shot that apartment. You created that apartment in a um, uh, in a studio, and then the uh, the windows were um, uh, LED. Yeah, it's like huge LED screens because it was interesting. We tried to actually get into a real apartment, but everyone's like, no, and it's too complicated to shoot in you know twenty floors up. Um, but also, I wanted it to feel slightly alien, I guess, or slightly just left of reality. And so using the LED walls, and we shot plates, and, and it's actually the real shots. It's not graded, especially different than what it really was. But it just gives a slight unusualness to what it is. Um, and I felt like that helped create that tone, and then that felt very different to the tone of being back in the parents' house. And nice segue, you actually shot the parents' home in your parents' home. Can you, um, you know, tell yeah. the audience about yeah. that? <laughs> Foolishly. Uh, yeah, so it was, it was a weird thing because I knew, when as I was writing the script, I knew that I wanted to make it feel as specific as I possibly could, believing that if I made it specific, that it would unlock the universal, I guess, if I was careful enough with that. But, and so to do that, I wanted to, go back into my own life and into my own memories and my own thoughts. And as I was writing a childhood home, it was just my home came into my mind. And I hadn't lived there for 42, three years. So nobody, I hadn't been back there and my parents didn't live there and no one lived there. So we just knocked on the door and I was like, I still live here, can I come and film here? Um, <laughs> and they said yes, uh, luckily. But it was such a strange experience to be there. Like, I don't have necessarily 
particularly happy memories of being in that space. And I think part of me was wanting to go back and feel that again. Um, and so it was really interesting. I redecorated it to look like my house and like the photo that uh, Andrew holds up at the beginning to look at the house. That's actually me and my mum, photo of me and my mum when I first lived there. So it was a really interesting psychological experiment for me at the same time. Oh, tapping into mess. that, how surreal must have been that you're dealing with a character that is trying to come to terms with his past and his family, and then you're actually shooting in your... I mean, it's not yeah. autobiographical because your parents are still alive and... Yeah, so I think that was the thing. Look, my, my parents are still are still alive. Um, but at the same time, you know, I knew I wanted to, everything other than that, essentially, I wanted to feel like it was coming for me. And even even the element of loss, I think loss loss is such a all-encompassing emotion. Um, as, you know, grief especially is, a, is an all-encompassing emotion. Um, and so anyone you lose... That, that pain lingers, but also loss in all its forms, you know, and my family, you know, we lived there and then my family split, broke down. And so I had a lot of feelings based around that location. Um, so it was sort of fast, but it was great for the cast as well, weirdly. I think they felt like they were coming into this strange space that was sort of mine. And in a weird way, they could put themselves into that in kind of a fascinating way. All of us were willing to be vulnerable, I think, in making the film. You have two stories going at once. You have the love story, and then you have the him reconciliating, reconciliating with his uh, parents. Um, tell us about navigating those two strains. Yeah, I was quite nervous about that. I mean, there's lots of things that made me nervous making this. Um, but that was one of the things, because I knew I wanted it to feel like it wasn't two separate stories, that you were flowing into this memory or these ghosts or this version of the past, and then that was being drawn back into the present. Because I feel like the way we deal with our memories is they just are ever-present in our present day. So I wanted that to really feel like we were just flowing gently between these two worlds of whatever that might be. How challenging was it cinematically for you to approach what you just said, the memory aspect? Um, I noticed that you use 35 millimeter film um, and other um, aspects. Can you tell us about navigating that? Cinematically. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's using all of those things. It was like uh, 35 mils certainly helped, but it also there's a world in which you should you could make the present quite different than the family environment, but I didn't want it to feel too different. So actually film softened those edges, I think, and the visual aesthetic we... It, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell maybe, but I feel like as the film goes on, the family element and the present element becomes more enmeshed. And even visually, they become more enmeshed and more connected and changes of lenses and different use of zoom lenses and all of those kind of things that I thought would feel like we were sucking this story together. Um, and I think on, a, on one level, the film was always about me trying to explore how parental love and romantic love is so closely linked, tied together, that we learn one from our experience of the other. And so I wanted those things to be so uh, entwined together and kind of talk about, do that visually at the same time. Which leads me to the, the scene that I'll never forget about your film, the young character slipping into the bedroom of the parents uh, as an adult uh, but just cuddling with the two of them. I mean, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. That's such a powerful scene. Can you tell us about navigating that that scene? Yeah, I, I really, I really love that scene. I feel like it speaks to everything we sort of want as an adult to go back to some time that has vanished and will never return. And even to the extent that he's wearing those ridiculous pajamas. And he walks into the room and you're like, oh God, this is just, and I thought when he walked in, I was like, this looks ridiculous. But it fits because it's like he's putting on something that was his past that now doesn't fit and is uncomfortable, but he still wants to wear it in whatever this world is we've created. And then that sense of being with your parents in a really 
intimate way that almost is like being with a lover. Like it's, it's that close and intimate because now they're the same age. And so just having those intimate conversations that you would have with a lover, but now you're having them with your parents and all the things that he wished their life could have been and all the things that she wishes the life could have been. Um, yeah, I, f it's, I find it a very touching scene. It was interesting to shot because it's Chooks is one shot and it's one roll of film. So it kept running out before the end of the film, the end of the scene. I was like, oh God, like, please just do it a bit quicker, actors, because we've only got one roll of film. Um, but no, I think it's a, it's a nice scene. Um, the, the aspect of um, the fact that you have parents and children and coming to terms, um, can you navigate the, the, that new ones? The fact that the film is all about you know, love, but also about relationship with your parents. Um, navigating the two strains, and was it hard to? Yeah, but I, I guess I always took it from this same kind of standpoint that I think the, you know, the reason that we want love is because we want to be known and understood by someone else, uh, by anybody, <laughs> by whatever that in whatever way that takes. And so, in both of those relationships that are happening, it's about Adam trying to be understood by the people that he wants in his life who care about him. But also the other way around as well. It's about also the parents being known. And I think especially in parental relationships, it's very easy to feel like, well, I'm the kid, you're the adult, you're supposed to know what to do. Uh, but of course, it's more complicated than that. And as you get older and become a parent, you realize that that is more complicated. Um, and so I was just trying to, in both of those relationships, it's about how do we how do we connect? How do we become understood? How are we compassionate to others? Because in the end, that's probably the hallmark of what love is, is to realize that you have to give love to someone else when they need it as much as you need to take it in return. One of the, I mentioned to you before, one of the most poignant moments is the fact that the mother is not questioning his sexuality or, um, you know, just, uh, denigrating the, his sexuality, but she's more concerned about him being accepted and finding love. Um, can you, you know, tell us about that? that yeah, aspect? look, I think like you know, coming out is always complicated. It was especially coming coming out in the 1980s was complicated. It was a very different time than it is now, thank God. Um, and so for me, that scene becomes about two things. It becomes about him trying to be understood by his mum and him also sort of being dragged back to a period uh, when it was very difficult to be gay and how both of those things are within him and he's kept them within him and in many ways is stopping him living a full like life in the present. So I feel like the scene is about both of those things at the same time, reminding him of how everyone used to think back then. But also it was really important to me that there was, again, compassion towards the mother, even though she sort of sort of accepting and then not and this saying some pretty awful things but at the same time she's doing it because she loves her son because it's very complicated she has to readjust her understanding of him um and so you know i and the same with the scene with the dad uh when he talks to his dad about you know why weren't you there for me when i was crying and why weren't you there when i needed you there's so many questions that we have with our parents that were just unsaid. And I think it's regardless of sexuality. They ex exist in loads of reasons. Right. There's lots of very unhappy kids that don't understand why their parents can't seem to be there for them in the way that they need them. So um, I just was kind of deal with all of those things, make it specific, but also make it uh, that it could be relatable to other people. I have loved all of your films, but previously in looking and weekend, your sex scenes um, are shot very objectively, but the sex scenes in this film are subjective. They're very sensual, very emotional. Can you tell us the the, the drift, the yeah, change? Yeah, it's again, it's thinking about like how I talked at the beginning about it being like I wanted to, the the flat to represent his aloneness. I wanted that sex to really, you can feel this growing intimacy and this vulnerability that is coming out of uh, Adam and then being softened by Harry. And so it was, to me, it was about touch and feeling and 
breath and sound and all of those kind of things that make you feel like you're in this intimate moment. And sex to me is so interesting on screen because sometimes it feels exploitative and I don't want to necessarily see that either. But I think sex on screen, when it's doing something for the characters, you feel like it is, they are growing together. Then I think sex can be great on screen. It just needs to be done in a way that feels like it's truthful to what is happening in that moment. Oh, Weekend, your previous film, your, which I adore. People, do your homework. Watch Weekend and 45 Years if you haven't. Weekend is all about relationships, and 45 Years is about family dynamics, and this film integrates those two strains in a gorgeous way. Can you tell us about, uh, from your vantage point, that, that journey? Yeah, I think I've always been interested in pretty much the same things, which is uh, how we integrate ourselves into the world, how we find ourselves within the world, and how we need the support of other people to do that, our family and our parents and lovers. And so, you know, we define ourselves through our relationships. So I'm always obsessed by relationships. And it was funny because I knew I wanted to make a film about parenting and its relationship to what we become as adults but I could never find the right story so when because this is a loose adaptation so when it came to me I was like of course if you do it within this metaphysical space or you see them as ghosts that's the way that it felt like the right way to do it because they are the things that haunt us the things that are unsaid the things that we try to suppress and repress the thing that we ignore they are the things that just keep haunting us um you did mention this is loosely based on another uh, on a novel is Yamada's uh, Strangers novel. Um, tell us about switching the gender in Yamada's is a straight couple. Yeah. You switched it to a gay couple. Why? I mean, I mean, a because I am gay, so it felt like if I'm going to do this personally, then I may as well be personal about it. But also, you know. I did want to talk very specifically about, I suppose, queer experience, but also queer love and the things that can hinder it or make it complicated. Um, and I do think that, um, and this isn't just for queer people, but the relationship that queer people have with their family can be quite complicated, obviously, because you were turning around to your family and saying, oh, I'm not like you, you are different than me, unless your family is your parents are also queer, then that's different. But you're very different from your family. And I feel like lots and lots of queer people I know, even younger people, and the world is different now, but even young, they just feel separate from that experience of being at the center of the family. So I wanted to sort of be, find a way to explore that difference that is there within a, within, you know, that lots of gay people feel. Was there any concern that the audience will be, will feel alienated about you know, a queer love story? I mean, luckily, I think times have changed, so people are more open to seeing different uh, experiences. But, you know, when I went to Blueprint, who gave me the book, um, the producers, and I came back to them and said, I want to now make it that it's a queer couple, I thought they'd be like, oh, God, really? Jesus, I'm going to find that harder to fund. I was like, oh, God. But actually, they didn't. They were like, yeah, that sounds a good way to do it. That feels like it's an interesting way into this story. Um, and... Searchlight never had any, or Film 4, both who backed the film, had no qualms about that. That They never asked, like, can you make it a little bit less gay? Can you, like, the, there was no, <laughs> which is often what you get. It's just, just, <laughs> just quieting down a little bit. Uh, so they've been very supportive about that. Um, it's very specific about the 80s and about a certain age gay person, um, how do you think um, the younger uh, generation feels about this portrayal? Yeah, I'm intrigued and like, you know, I stay off Twitter, which is very healthy for everybody to do, so I don't listen to what too many people are saying. But you know, I think there will be some young people, there'll be lots of young people, and I know because I've been to screenings with younger people, uh, who they completely get it and understand it and feel it. And then there are other people that will look at it and be like, oh, that feels so alien to me. What are, what, what's he complaining about? You know, can't you get over those things? But And I'm kind of glad that they might have that 
opinion because it means that things are better now. But it doesn't mean that it wasn't difficult for a generation of people. So uh, my responsibility is not to represent everybody within a community. It's to represent how I see things, I suppose. That's my goal. Um, and you know what? Like, I like that people have different opinions about mm -hmm. whether it they want to see that on the screen or not see that on the screen. Um, I just don't want to listen to it too much. Um, one of the centerpieces in the film is the Valhall Tavern sequence. Um, can you tell us about shooting that? It's just stunning, the magenta colors, the, the whole look of that sequence. Yeah, I mean, look, it was great. It could be shot in a club that I used to go to pretty much every weekend for the whole of the 90s. So I knew that place intimately, um, which was kind of fun. But I knew that I wanted that kind of, that section of the story. Like, it's sort of going along in a certain way where you sort of understand what it's doing time-wise, I suppose. And then I did want it to sort of take off and push into something else where you're sort of like, I'm not entirely sure what is real and what's not real. And is it drugs? Is it not drugs? And, you know, usually he travels back to his parents and this time he just wakes up in the bed back at his parents. And so I wanted it to sort of separate from the rest of the story. And it was a really good sequence to shoot. I love shooting those kind of sequences. All the songs in the, in the story were pretty much scripted. So they're all in there from the very beginning. I knew the purpose of all of the music. I knew how I wanted to shoot those sequences. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was yeah, great to do. And then casting Adam Scott. Um, the importance of having a gay actor portraying your lead character. Yeah, so uh, I'm kind of not obsessed by the fact that it has to be people playing the same version of themselves. Um, but with Andrew and, um, and with Adam and with Andrew, I wanted it to be that, yeah, I feel like he had to be. There's so much nuance that I wanted to, to express and I, you feel it in his performance. Like when he's talking to his mom or he's talking about running away, how he used to run away or the stuff with the dad. Like well, I watch it and it's such a genuine emotional reaction coming from Andrew. And I feel like, of course you can act that without having a similar experience but Andrew just understood it and he was prepared to go to, I think, quite an emotionally complicated place for him and embrace it and take it on and fill his performance with that. And so I couldn't have been yeah, happier. I think he's, and he does a marvelous job. And him has, I mean, is scintillating the relationship between the two of them. Is that something <laughs> that you expect then? When you cast? You hope for it. I mean, look, it's Paul Mescal. I mean, who's not going to, like, be excited to be with him? I think most people are. Uh, but, but this was before the big, yeah, you know, yeah. he got nominated for it's the Oscar, Oscar et cetera. Yeah. But I knew he was such a good actor. And again, it's like, I don't like just offering a role to someone. Like, I want to sit down with them, and I want them to talk to me about why they want to do it. Like, that to me is the important thing. Not why I want them to do it. I'd like to know why they want to do it. And he just understood that character. And he understood sort of everything about it, really. And he also understood what the character was there for Adam, what that was about, the compassion that he needed to give Andrew. Um, and not that many actors are that generous, and he's a very generous actor. Um, plus, then when I put them together in a room, they were so, like, you could tell they were in love with each other. They just, they were so excited to be with each other. And they're still really good friends now, and they hang out all the time, and they're really close. And that's all you can hope for, is to see that there is a chemistry there, and then do everything you can not to mess it up, and, like, capture it with the right angles, the right camera, create an environment that's not hellish for people so it doesn't seep all that chemistry away. You know, you're trying to capture a magic, and so you have to create an environment that allows that magic to sort of be there, I suppose. To me, speaking of magic, the scene between Jamie Bell, Claire Foy, and, and Scott in the dining room talking to one another is just, it's kismet. It's just, you know, tell us about shooting that scene, writing it and shooting that sequence. Yeah, I mean, look, there were so many scenes when I, I was so concerned, to be honest, that they just would not work. Like, I was concerned that the idea of, that nobody would even buy this idea of the parents 
being still his parents, but younger than him, and are you going to still emotionally connect? But as soon as we started shooting, I realized it does work, or I felt like it worked. I could feel it as I'm shooting. But you do something um, I should have brought up earlier that you don't emphasize on the supernatural aspect of it. You you emphasize the emotional and the core of the emotional aspect of the of the the scenes. Correct? Yeah, and that that it's I, I'm following an emotional feeling rather than anything else. But also, it's so strange when you think about parents, your own parents. You don't think of them usually as they are now anyway, if they're still with you. You think of them as when they were younger anyway, I think. That's when you spend all the time with your parents. So it felt like it would have made sense anyway if he was going to imagine them coming back or they are coming back or however you want to see it, uh, that they would feel like that. But, you know, the scenes were very... A lot of the scenes were very emotional to, to do for me to watch, for the crew to watch, for the actors to perform. I could feel... In many ways, we were trying to navigate the right levels of emotion so it wasn't like, oh, God, everyone's crying again. Like, because <laughs> nobody wants to see an hour and 45 minutes of just people crying the whole time. So, like... And in the edit, it was about pushing, knowing that, okay, this one maybe needs to be reined in so the next one can be larger or bigger or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that took the longest time in the edit was navigating how and when the emotional stuff comes out. Yeah, but that specific scene in the diner was super... Yeah, it took me a long, long time to write. Because, you know, you can push it towards melodrama. You can make it too subtle. Um, but I did make a decision pretty early on that I still wanted to be uh, sincere, I guess, about the emotions that are being discussed and at stake. And if you're going to get the ghosts of your parents to... to you know, say what you want them to say, then you've got to make sure it's the right things that help him move forward. Um, and also him say the right things to them, because that scene was very much, for me, a realisation for Adam that love is not one-sided. It's a two-sided thing. And that you have to give it back to your parents. Like, he doesn't fully tell his mum what happened in the accident, even though she wants to know. She's like, he's, you know, says, yes, you died instantly, which he didn't. But there's things you keep when you love someone in order to, to, to soften their experience. Mm -hmm. um, loaded question, but what would you like the audience to take away from your very personal film? You know, it was always about trying to allow the audience to have their own relationship to the film, I suppose, so that they would leave and reflect on... Uh, elements of their own lives and their own relationships, whether that be with parents or lovers or friends or whoever it might be, and with people that they've lost and people that are still around and all of those kind of things. And that it could... I wanted sort of my personal to then feel like it was unlocking other people's personal. Because um, that can be the power of any film, when you feel like it's not my life, but somehow it's talking to elements of my life. Um, and I wanted the film to keep a sort of mystery so that when you leave it, it's, it is like when you wake up from a dream and you're sort of, I know I've been presented something and I sort of understand it, but I don't fully understand my emotional reaction to the dream. And then I think that helps you ask interesting questions as you're like driving home or the next day or whatever it might be. Um, and so, I, you know, that's what I just hope that it just is they take away the film with them and get to live with it a little bit longer within them. Well, I, your trajectory cinematically is brilliant. I can't wait for the next film. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.